one. We are live on a new episode of the Let's Check Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraub. How are you doing today, Seth? I'm good. All right. We have a bunch of news to discuss about the EV space this week, but we're going to start out with Tesla with the Cyber Roundup slash shareholder meeting that happened just yesterday, and we're going to go through all the news with that, and then we have a few other news items to discuss in the broader EV space. And also, we're going to discuss the BMW i4 review that said just posted today after spending uh, what you were, yeah, the week with the car. Yep, full week. Yeah. All right. And uh, also, I want to thank, uh, thank everyone that uh, posted uh, five star reviews of the podcast last week. Uh, we, there were a few of you that did it, and I really appreciate it a lot. It helps the show a lot more than you think. So if you can go into your podcast app and leave us a five-star review, we read them all, and we appreciate them, and it helps the show a lot more than you think. Uh, also, it's free to do. So, Also, if you do enjoy this, so you can put it in, if you're watching live on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever. LinkedIn, too. We're on LinkedIn. Michael is, uh, is listening to us live on LinkedIn. Hello, Michael. Uh, you can uh, give us a like or a share. That helps the show a lot, too. All right, let's jump in. So the shareholder meeting from Tesla that uh, kind of now is called the um, Cyber Roundup, I guess, or, or maybe it's more like the formal version of the meeting first, and then the presentation that follows is not called the Cyber Roundup. That's how Tesla sort of marketed it. But yeah, uh, the actual proposals that were up for vote during the meetings went pretty much as planned. Tesla hasn't, hasn't posted the full result just yet, so we don't have all the details. But uh, it sounds like it. Let me see here in my notes. Uh, yeah. That uh, proposal uh, two, three, only the proposal two, three, and six were voted against the board. So that was ex uh, shortening the terms from three to two years for the directors and uh, removing the super ma majority uh, requirement while also shut down by investors. And six, uh, six uh, was an approval of. Uh, uh, the uh, actual shareholder proposal that actually passed. I don't remember which one it was. It was all about the governance uh, issues. Like, uh, I think it was for a uh, re uh, review of the abrutation um, requirements at Tesla when there's an employee conflict. But uh, yeah, and of course, the, the big the big items were the big items. The the big item really was the stock split. Uh, so the shareholders had to vote on whether or not they were gonna. They, they will allow Tesla to increase the amount of share outstanding so that they could uh, do a one a three for one st uh, stock split. And uh, that was approved unsurprisingly by investors. So we don't know yet when it's going to happen. Again, Tesla hasn't released all the full results from the meeting. So we, once they release that, we're going to have a better idea of the timeline. Uh, the other big items here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, a strange comment. Maybe you're not the right spot, Michael. If uh, maybe you stay or stay on, and then uh, we're gonna we're gonna convince you, Michael. You convince you otherwise by the end of the show. So then the big the big thing was the uh, presentation from Elon and all the Q and A's that followed. Uh, a lot of it was Tesla just patting themselves on the back for a great year, and that's fair because Tesla has had a great year, uh, especially in the context of the auto industry. Uh, which had mostly a setback uh, still from, from the pandemic and then inflation supply chain issue that followed. Tesla has navigated those quite well. Uh, so Tesla uh, proudly announced that it produced a 3 million uh, vehicle. C congrats. Uh, congrats on that. Uh, Model Y tracking to be the world's best-selling car uh, by revenue this year and then by volume next year, which is not too surprising because once Gigafactory Texas and Berlin are in full swing, these v these two factories are going to exclusively produce Model Y for a while, and they're going to produce it in high volumes. And then when you had that, what Tesla is doing in Shanghai, and also Fremont are producing a lot of Model Ys, the, uh, it's going to be a hard to beat in terms of uh, uh, just pure volume. Then there was a few other more surprising stuff, like uh, the Optimus, uh, I mean, you might have a robot. So Elon uh, posted this uh, image that appears to be the teaser of the actual prototype that's going to be unveiled next month. And again, Elon reiterated that people don't understand how big of an impact it's going to have. It's going to be bigger than the auto industry, uh, the, sorry, than Tesla's automotive business. And it's going to reshape the way the economy works. And I, again, with that, I, like, I don't understand why he keeps saying that, like people don't understand it. I think anyone would understand that 
a humanoid robot powered by a sophisticated AI that's able to uh, do a lot of tasks that would replace uh, manual labor, people doing manual labor, that would have a giant impact. What people are skeptical about that is just a delivery on it. It's as simple yeah. as that. And I, don't, I mean, I know that he's very confident in his AI team and his uh, humanoid robotic teams and all that. And that, that's all fair and everything. But like you have to give people room for doubt here. This is a giant task. And I mean, if someone's going to do it, uh, I think Tesla could be the, the company to do it. But maybe not on this uh, insane timeline that Elon has. I mean, he's still saying production in 2023 for that thing. Um, Tesla Optimist, they're calling it. But it's cool to see an actual picture of what appears to be a working prototype, or at least hands of a working prototype, instead of just someone in a suit dancing on stage. Is it me, or does this, like, do the base of the palms look like door hinges? Oh, they do, yeah, you're right. It does look, well, I mean, it probably is some kind of hinge, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, but it looks a very, <laughs> it looks like very, uh, I don't know, went to Home Depot. Yeah, but to, to be fair, the, the like the hands are probably one of the toughest uh, robotic components to, to for sure to, to achieve, and uh, these don't look too bad. Like the fact that they're even able to create like an art shape, but as long as uh, you know they have uh, strength requirements that they posted, that I have them here. Um, no, I just have the actuators here, but they did post some like uh, re requirements on time or what they can lift and everything, and it was like mm -hmm. decent, like maybe fifty pounds or so. Other people. Can can just uh, work around with 50 pounds. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, th this could be a great deal, but I mean, let's let's give them a shot. Let's wait until September 30th, uh, what they show uh, at, at that event. Like uh, if they, they could they could surprise many because if you look into the comments of that post, 260 comments and, and a lot of it is just like, we believe this nonsense, like this, let's not, we're going to do that and everything is like that. Look, Tesla has surprised a lot of people before. Elon has surprised a lot of people with SpaceX doing everything. It's not impossible. And Tesla, like, I mean, you, you see what Boston Dynamics has been doing. It's very impressive stuff. Of course, it's not a humanoid robot. They, they do have one, like, a humanoid, like, bipedal, like, walking robot, but not, I don't think they have anything with the uh, hands dexterity that uh, are human level, like they are saying here in this uh, presentation. But, uh, Tesla does have, like one of the big things is like getting these robots to be powered by electricity and, and have a functional uh, battery life. And uh, Tesla does have a lot of experience with that with their, their vehicles. So there is uh, kind of an expertise here. That, and they do also have some kind of uh, actuator expertise for, for the vehicles too that uh, can be applied to the robot. So that's, uh, I, I mean, I see Tesla having uh, some, some technical skills that are going to apply very well to the Optimus robot. Um, However, is it going to be as useful as Elon saying on, on any kind of realistic timeline? I have my doubts too, but I wouldn't count him out like a lot of people are doing right now. All right. The other big one was the uh, new <coughs> factory. And Elon said again that Tesla is going to announce or likely announce by the end of the year a new location for, the te for a Tesla factory. And he again teased Canada to be a location for it. So we've been reporting in the last uh, year or so that uh, there's been a lot of rumors around the next factory from Tesla being Canada. Uh, this time was uh, Elon said after announcing, are we going to announce it later this year on location? He asked the crowd, where are we going to build it? And of course, the crowd started yelling uh, a bunch of different locations. And then Elon said, we got a lot of Canada. I'm half Canadian. Maybe I should. Uh, of course, it's it's not that big of a teaser, but the fact that he just decided to pick out like there was a bond, I, I couldn't hear a thing that they were saying. They was dealing out so many things, and the fact that Canada is the one that caught his attention is interesting. In the context that we reported in June from the recordings of the company wide meeting that we obtained, that uh, when employees ask Elon when is where is going to be the next Tesla factory in the U.S., Elon corrected the employee saying that actually we're also looking in Canada and Mexico. Uh, so it's broader to North America and not necessarily the U.S. So the fact that now he says that, specify that might not be in um, the U.S., but Canada or Mexico. And also we reported um, last year, late last year, that uh, Tesla has been in talks with the Quebec government that has a multi-billion dollar investment program uh, to put battery production uh, in Quebec. So, of course, Quebec and Canada as a whole, too, has a lot of... Uh, natural resources that are used for batteries especially nickel lithium and even some cobalt and graphite a lot of graphite in canada and especially quebec 
So something to keep an eye on because here's the thing: Tesla is gonna. That like, I'm I'm even surprised that there hasn't been a new factory location announcement for for a while now. Uh, literally since uh, I guess Texas was the most recent one that was announced. Uh, Berlin was before Texas. Yeah. Because again, uh, even Robin Denholm, Tesla's uh, chairwoman at the meeting, reiterated again: Tesla is aiming and tracking for 20 million a production rate of 20 million vehicles annually by uh 2030 that's that's eight years from now less than eight years from now and to go from there they're probably going to exit this year like that by two million and like as a whole these four factories maybe have around four million once they're completely ramped up so there's still a six million that's completely unannounced on on no groundbreaking or anything like that so there's there's the, and elon again said that they believe probably they're going to need about 12 gigafactories to um uh, to get to that 20 million so that's uh that's eight gigafactories that needs to be announced built and ramp up in the, within the <coughs> next eight years yep so if you're following it's more than one per year because while you have eight years to do it it takes at least, at the very least, well, two years, probably at least, probably three years to be fairly ramped up so that they all need to be announced within the next five years. Uh, that's uh, that's quite a schedule here for a new factory on Tesla. So let's keep an eye out for that. Of course, we believe that uh, don't expect them all to be in North America. There should be at least one or two more in Europe, one or two more in um, Asia. Uh, so this, the, the, but there's definitely going to be a lot of things moving on that front. And then there was a little uh, cyber truck update, nothing too big, but uh, <laughs> some uh, someone uh, asked uh, Elon if, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was kind of an optimistic ask here. They asked if uh, Tesla is going to increase the cyber truck prices and if they're going to honor, honor the price that Tesla originally announced for in 2019 for the people that placed the reservation at that time. And Elon kind of laughed that off and saying that the pricing that was on 2009 was um before all the inflation and that they couldn't predict and also he, he somehow brought up that the reservation was just 99 dollars uh, actually well, first of all it was a hundred dollars but uh, uh i don't know how like because it was just a hundred dollars like you you don't lock your price in it anyway we weren't we no <coughs> one was expecting those prices to last uh so elon confirmed that there's going to be an update in pricing and an update in specs but he he says that it's going to be a, a damn fine machine and a hell of a product, but uh, yeah, that's um, still coming in mid 2023. Though I, he did say he did say it twice during the meeting. He said production started mid 2023. <laughs> then he, he later he corrected himself and said that volume production is going to start in 20 mid 2023. So that was uh, that's those are two different things: starting production and achieving volume production. Wildly different. Uh, so depending on how you see it like tesla could be aiming to start production a lot sooner than that especially with the cyber truck where there's going to be a lot of um, manufacturing technology improvement that need to be achieved in order to deliver that truck with the you know tesla is going to is apparently get, getting delivery of the new world largest uh, casting machine and uh, elon did say also that the, they are planning on starting to install production equipment in the coming months like you factory texas so uh, but of course, start, starting to installing them and commissioning them and starting to assemble trucks, those are all extremely different goals. So, but yeah, I mean, 40, the, the, the price original lease were $40,000 for the base version. Uh, technically, uh, Ford is delivering trucks, uh, the F 150 Lightning, at $40,000. Of course, the a very bare minimum version of the truck. As soon as you add a few things, it goes up pretty quickly. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised that if uh, Ford's uh, F-150 Lightning average sell price right now is probably, what, 70000 I would say? Does that make sense to you? Uh, Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, I would be surprised if this little cyber truck starts for less than sixty thousand dollars they're probably gonna try to make it at least have a few version under eighty thousand dollars for the new uh, federal tax credit uh, to be applicable and there's a limit of eighty thousand dollars for trucks and, uh, and and SUVs and and vans so it would make it would, it would make sense to try to have that and I, I think also I mean, it's like a double in price for the original price of forty thousand dollars but uh, yeah expect a higher price. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, we had a little exclusive this week on the solar roof. I mean, we had a bunch of exclusives on the solar roof over the last uh, month. But uh, solar roof version 3.5 is coming. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know exactly what's new with it. We knew we know that Tesla has been focusing on the ease of installation and also the durability of the solar tiles. So uh, it might be uh, related to that. But we do know that Tesla has started a bunch of installation and employee homes. So they are testing, uh, testing it uh, there first. And they did the same thing with the previous version of the product. And uh, we reported recently that Tesla has stopped scheduling new installation of solar roof with its own team, its own teams uh, during the last quarter. And uh, sources familiar with the matter told us that, that they're not planning to restart the installation until Q4. So that would make sense that Tesla is now testing that uh, version 2.5 and they're going to restart production with uh, restart installation with that. Um, some people are still installing the product, like third party roofing companies and solar companies that are partnered with Tesla. Uh, and it sounds like Tesla still has some supply of the version 3.0 and sending that to those people. So what do you think uh, 3.5 is going to have? I think the the big thing is going to be like customization and uh, ease of installation because right now Tesla just cannot install this at any kind of rate that makes sense. Like they are really much focusing on their solar rooftop retrofits with uh, the solar panels, just because like if they have one crew that install solar roofs instead of solar panels, well they, they Tesla is missing out on like literally megawatts of installation every quarter just because of how much more difficult the solar roof is to install in solar panels. So Tesla has to find a way to make that easier. Uh, I've seen I've seen a few suggestions, like in this image that you see right here, like having like entire rows like that. I think right now Tesla is limited, maybe like four or five tiles in a row at the same time that they deploy. If they can deploy like entire rows and just clip it in, uh, that could probably have a uh, significant impact. But also it's just a problem with those solar roof is that every roof is different. and like you have a skylight or you have like a chimney or you have like whatever you have and you have to work around that and tesla doesn't necessarily have all the fittings that match the solar roof with um any type of uh, i don't know like any type of special but it's not that special obviously a skylight or, so, or a chimney but any kind of thing that it's not just a flat roof yeah i wonder if it's gonna look less like a roof and more like just solar panels to make it easier to install I hope I hope it doesn't. Like I hope they keep the aesthetics of it. Um, yeah, I mean the aesthetics are one thing, but also like the the great thing about the product is like it's a product that you can install from, as a brand new roof instead of like uh, putting solar panels on top of a brand new roof. Or if you need a new roof soon, well, I'll just install that instead. Of, so it opens up a different market, really. But uh, I don't. I don't know many people are really buying that over the aesthetics of it. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sure. I mean, some. I guess it could also be more efficient, use better panels. Um, you know, maybe, maybe better wiring, better, better inverters, stuff like that. Yeah, and especially bit like just ease of installation and and uh, speed of installation. All right, Model S and X are finally coming back to Europe. Uh, Tesla started reaching out to some uh, customers in Europe saying that the deliveries are going to start uh, in most market. I think it's going to be in November, but might be some deliveries before that. And then uh, they started taking orders again just for the plaid version of Model S and X. But uh, I would expect the long range version to follow soon. So if you remember, Tesla's since the refresh, Tesla was still taking reservation uh, for the Model S and X, but uh, they stopped in December of last year in Europe. Just, or at least anywhere outside of North America, just because the ramp up back from production after uh, shutting down uh, for the refresh was extremely slow. Like Tesla shut down production in January of 2021. Model S started back in June, Model X in October. So Model X was almost a full year without production. And then the ramp up was pretty tough too. And Tesla is still not at full capacity. Um, I posted that somewhere here. Yeah, uh, so Q3 2021, Tesla has about 9,000 Model X and X. It ramped up to 13,000 units in Q4. Q1 2021, 14,000 units. And then uh, last quarter's was 16,000 units. So the pretty slow ramp up here. And because Tesla's full capacity officially would be 25,000 units a quarter. So we're still about a little less than 10,000 units from that. 
But the fact that they are reopening uh, the order book in Europe would would probably point towards Tesla making some improvement on that front. And uh, the deliveries for the new orders are like December to February, uh, December 2022 to February 2023. So it sounds like Tesla is like preparing a, a giant load of well, S and X that are going to be shipped to Europe in November but, or, or for November deliveries. And then literally by December, they should have um, completed the backlog of order that they were taking in until December of last year. But yeah, it would be good for the European market to uh, get them all as the next again. They literally didn't starve of it for. Uh, yeah, it's crazy the that they had no yeah. access to Model S and X. Yeah, that's just two flagship cars, really. Yeah, they have never had the refresh interior yet and all that stuff. No yokes. No yokes. No. I wonder if that was an issue, like getting. Uh, oh, maybe they needed approval, or yeah. maybe it's not uh, legal configuration there. I don't yeah. know. All right, that's pretty much uh, done for Tesla today. Uh, we have a bunch of other news items to discuss, but if you guys have any questions for us, put them in the comment section right now. We're gonna get to them in a few minutes. Uh, any subjects you wanted to discuss or any uh, specific question, you can just put question and then uh, write it in the comment section right now. We're gonna get to them in a few minutes. But now let's uh, go to set for uh, the BMW i4. I think you have a lot of thought on, the, on this set. Yeah, I had to <clears throat> get this out a little bit earlier than I hoped because I mm -hmm. had to make a run to the city in my uh, current uh, loaner car, which is the Mercedes EQS, which is a lot nicer than this car. Sad, <laughs> sad to say. Uh, a lot more expensive, too. <laughs> twice as expensive, so <laughs> you would expect that. Um, so, yeah, the i4 is basically a 4 Series BMW that it seems almost like a high school engineering team converted to an EV. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, but that's, that's just what it looks like. It's not what it behaves like. So if you open that front, uh, hood and, and that's kind of the first thing I do in the video, um, it's just really ugly underneath there. Um, and of course my, my dog's in the video. Um, <laughs> sounds like your <clears throat> dog wants to jump in the front. The two used to Tesla's are like, hey, yeah, okay. nobody was yeah. by me in the, in the front. Well, there's actually room for her in there. Surprisingly, <laughs> like it's just a big honking hole. Um, where you know you could put a frunk or you could make a smaller hood and that's kind of the problem like this is a a internal combustion engine car without the internal combustion engine and, and exhaust pipes and and everything else and they you know they they basically put in a, an electric power train the problem is is that you've got this huge hood that is basically pointless now and that pushes the cabin back so that means you have less space in the front seats. It means the back seats are also pushed back against like the back thing. So um, that means a six footer like myself uh, can barely, you know, put his head in there without uh, hitting the top of the, the ceiling. And there's a little bit less space. You know, there's, there's a picture of me for those on YouTube. Um, it's, it's, it's fine. Like I can sit back there, but it's, you know, anybody taller than me is not going to enjoy that at all. <clears throat> so, you know, that's kind of the problem. Like BMW 10 years ago did the i3 from the ground up, an electric vehicle. Uh, I think that was a pretty good vehicle. Um, it was a, you know, it looked kind of weird. It had like the suicide doors, which, you know, not great for dropping off the kids at school, for instance. A lot of problems with the design, but, you know, it was an efficient car and it worked well and it was packed, packed together nicely. Here they're taking, you know, an off-the-shelf kind of four-series car. They're ripping out the stuff, putting in EV components, and you know that that doesn't create an efficient car. So it's it's a great, you know, sitting next to my Model Three. Model Three is a three, you know, equivalent to a three-series in size, but it actually has more room than this four. Not only in the trunk, it, it has a frunk. Um, it has more room in the trunk. It has more room in the back seats. It has more room in the front seats. So how does a smaller car have more room in every area? Well, that's because the huge internal combustion engine compartment is to, is like, you know, a third of the car. Um, other problems, like we're looking right now at the, uh, uh, the charge bay, which is at an angle. And of course, if there's snow, there's going to be snow in there and it's going to be packed up with snow. So, you know, obviously they did this because that's where the gas tank uh, is on the, on the, the four series. Um, it even has a drive shaft uh, 
thing in the back seat. Like there's no drive shaft. Like the, there's a rear motor, and uh, there would be no reason for a drive shaft. But they have a drive shaft hole still in the back seat, and that you know even like what's like quadruply frustrating is they even it even looks like there's exhaust pipes coming out of the back, and that that for me as an EV person is like come on like hey you can see it kind of there like <laughs> they didn't even uh that's rough anyway so all that being said i have a lot of bad things there's a lot of bad things about this car but you know it is a bmw so like the interior was very nice like uh it drove very quietly i mean they're used to making internal combustion engine vehicles drive smoothly and and quietly so they put an ev engine in there and it's even quieter and even smoother so no gears to deal with um all kinds of stuff oh another problem you can see there the uh, charging screen you know this thing's supposed to have 300 miles of range and i never got it over 240 um here it's saying 229 is is 100 so <clears throat> not sure if that's you know i don't get it i don't quite understand why that was the case so overall not super impressed with it but like you know, if you're going to buy a BMW 4 Series, I think this is still the best 4 Series you can get. Um, it's uh, quiet, fast. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I got the rear-wheel drive version to test, but there's a M50 all-wheel drive version that uh, goes 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. That's got to be a pretty cool car. Uh, so it, I think it just goes to show you, like, how much better electric is, how, like, just taking a really good internal combustion car and putting electric in it makes it even better but i you know i'm not kicking myself for buying a model three uh <laughs> so th that's my take yeah i mean i remember i think it was in 2017 bmw flew me to munich to go to their ev like development center and then their the factory that they have uh i don't know maybe like 45 minutes outside of munich where they were deploying their first uh fifth uh, generation EV technology, and that was their whole their whole spiel was like, you, "Look, we're doing this smart. We're gonna we're we're like making this future proof where this fifth uh, generation platform, we can fit a plug in hybrid, an internal combustion engine car, or a full electric vehicle in it." I'm like, "Yeah," and I was like, "Okay, sure." Like, I get the guys don't want to go like just full all in electric just yet, but. Wouldn't that just result in a compromise for every single one of those uh, powertrain types? And they're like, "Yeah, but it's it's worth it." And um, that's what <laughs> that's what you see here. Is is it worth it? Uh, I mean, it it is worth it if like they can produce this in like extremely high volume. But I don't think they can right now. I don't think they have that capacity yet. So it just you just take the design and and engineering compromises. Without, because uh, that would that that was the the way they were selling it is like, oh, if there's super high demand for EVs, and when we can, we have they are built on the same production line, so we just can crank it up. Um, but you're not seeing that right now because, of course, there's supply chains issue that are completely unrelated to having the cars being assembled on the same assembly line. So it's uh, it's it's a bit of a bummer where BMW is at right now. They, I mean, I wouldn't put them in the same category as like Nissan with the like having the early lead with the Leaf, like. Uh, BMW did to a degree with the i3 and like dropping the ball. I think obviously BMW is far ahead of Nissan right now with the i4, the iX, the iX3 in other markets, and even the 3 Series now in uh, in China. In China, and, yeah, and, the i3. They have the i7, which is a super high end version. Well. Yeah, yeah, the i7. <clears throat> the, the, yeah, well, it's just it feels like it's uh, they, they 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 put a compromise because they're they're not ready to go all in on electric vehicles and um apparently that's gonna change in like three years i think they announced it's gonna have the first uh 2025 they're gonna have their first all electric built from the ground up all electric platform i think well first besides the yeah. i3 uh yeah i3 well, is the, the high tree like, the i3 uh no well yeah, yeah okay, okay no, no, no. <laughs> the i3 so dead to me that i'm like you know, when you said i3 i was thinking like three series in china but is the three series in china is that is that also built on the three series platform so the, the 3 Series in China is actually built on the 3 Series, like the i4 is built on the 4 Series. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. um, But the they're calling it the i3, even though the i3 was also that, you know. Oh, that's right. They are calling it the i3, yeah. This, this you know, taller, yeah. weird mobile, uh, yeah. I believe. 
the term. So it's a little bit confusing. Uh, I don't think they've, they're making the right moves right now. Uh, but fortunately, they have such a good uh, you know history of car making. They do very good uh, you know, suspension and very good uh, you know, just all around uh, car building that they can probably screw up a bunch and still somehow make it on the other side. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the I-PACE. Uh, so this was uh, kind of an unfortunate thing that I had to report on this week, but I think I think it's a concern that we need to keep a look at because I'm getting I'm getting good old like 2020, 2021 Bolt TV vibe here uh, on what's happening. Is uh, another Jaguar I-PACE caught on fire after charging. This happened in florida and back in june so the the owner reached out to me a few weeks ago uh, mr salazar gonzalo salazar and uh, he, he explained it, i mean it's very similar to a lot of the bull tv fires that we heard before where uh, there's no no impact no collision and no collision or anything like that it's just the car is plugged overnight for charging uh it's either used or not used for a little bit in this case he used it for like a 12 miles of running around uh, errands brought the car back into the garage didn't plug it in this time just let it sit for a little bit while he was uh, doing things inside then uh, you see smokes coming out of the garage uh, goes into the garage the car is smoking uh, and then of course he's like oh this thing is catching on fire i don't want it to catch on fire in my in my house so he he, he decided to check if he can drive it and, and he was i don't know if he drove it it was we'll just put it in uh, neutral or uh, but he, he was able to uh, have it drive it down to the street, basically right in front of his house, right right here. Basically, you see the, this driveway, and he drove it to the street, and uh, then uh, the the car went engulfed itself on fire. We have a quick video here from the the neighbors. Whoops. Sorry about that. I, I bet the neighbors there. weren't too happy about him driving into the yeah, street. Yeah, no. <laughs> he says you, you expect a nice letter from his HO. Oh, did you? See, I didn't see that. Wow. Did you see that? Yeah, explosion. Yeah, there was an explosion Roman that candle. Flew. Yeah, kind of, that flew from the car. Um, yeah, so as you can imagine, the car is a total loss, and clearly it was a battery fire. You can hear the the, the batteries popping off, and uh, the so this is not the first time that has happened with the Jaguar. It hasn't caught the news too much, but this is the fourth time that I can uh, confirm that a Jaguar Hape is caught on fire on its own without any impact. So always with similar situation, whether uh, parked um, in the garage or in a driveway and catching a fire or well, actually plugged in and charging. And the last uh, three of them were in the last year. Uh, so this this is uh, ramping up, obviously. And this is not quite the bull TV numbers that we, we saw before. Well, it's kind of getting close to before the, the uh, actual um, recall, but because there were 17 total bull TV fires that were reported. But I think we were like at eight before they decided to do the recall. And the numbers are different for the bull TV and the Jaguar. There's just about 50,000 Jaguar high pace out there in the world, while the bull TV is closer to like 120, 130,000 units. So the, the numbers are going to be similar. And why do I have a concern about this? Is because Jaguar uses the LG pouch cells just infamous, like, infamous yeah, the, LG pouch. Yeah, just like the Bolt TV and the Kona that were right. recalled, and which w there was another one that was recalled too. Well, the Kona uh, and the uh, what you call it use the same the um, Hyundai. Yeah, but I, th I thought there was another Kia, Kia Nero, right? Yeah, but I thought there was another one too that uh, like a, another like not like lower volume vehicle that was also recalled uh, for uh, for the LG power cells. So what we did, obviously, like three in the last year, four total. I reached out to Jaguar. I'm like, what? Okay. And because also the owner, while he reached out to me, he's like, he didn't feel a lot of uh, proactive reaction from Jaguar about this. He said his insurance, of course, just, like declared a total loss. They tried to look into like what would be the cause of the fire, but like, it's not like, I mean, they look at this, like it's just not much left to figure it out. And um, the, uh, Jaguar was supposed to inspect the car to also like investigate what would be the cause of the fire, but Jaguar kept telling him like we, we the car could reignite, so we don't know where we can expect inspect it. So they're like we don't have access to to anything we can inspect the car, um, and but but they said that while well, they said that the car is already on the 
called part salvage vehicle website. So I don't know, I don't know if it's ever going to be uh, really investigated that much. And then when we reached out to Jaguar about this, and like we, we reached out to them, like, hey, what do you know about this incident in particular? And they gave us the whole, like, oh, this, we cannot tell you anything until we do an investigation. Again, investigation doesn't look like it's going much of nowhere. Um, but then we asked separately, have you looked into like the cell that you're using from LG uh, in those cars? Because this is a 2019 um, iPay, so it's before the recall. And I think all of the cars that come on fire were uh, prior to the recall, two of the cells. Uh, have you looked into into it with the LG? Is it a problem? Is it, are you gonna guys have to recall that too? And they said they weren't gonna answer those questions. So not very satisfied with that response. Hopefully. Uh, we can put some pressure on them and they can eventually like uh, give us some answers because this is not, this is not looking good to me. Yeah. Um, and um, doesn't um, Magna build the, the I-Pace? Yeah. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if we should reach out to them. Maybe they have some information there. Yeah. We could because try. It, it doesn't sound like Jaguar's up on their, their own product. Really. Yeah, but if Jaguar is the customer is there, so right. I feel like they would be like, oh, let's just refer back to Jaguar. All right. Um, Lucid posted their earnings this week, and um, the uh, their stock crashed following the earnings result because uh, the, big, the big news as part of the earnings was the production guidance for the full year has been cut dr dr drastically. Uh, they used to be aiming for 12 to 14,000 vehicles to be produced in 2022. They cut that in half to six to 7,000 units. So that's a, that's a big bummer. We already have, we're more than halfway through the year and now they are starting to cut the production guidance. And they did that because they have only produced so far 1,400 vehicles this year. So they're going to have to produce uh, between uh, 560 and more than 5,600 5, uh, to uh, come to the lower end of their guidance. And uh, they, uh, they, um, they delivered 679 vehicles during the last quarter uh, for a revenue of 97 millions. And uh, yeah, that's uh, obviously this is a concern with those uh, new electric vehicle startups where we are looking at their cash position and we're looking at how much cash they're burning every quarter to see like how fast they need to turn positive in order to survive or again they don't necessarily need to need that to survive but they or if they don't do that they're gonna have to raise more money and this is not the best time to raise money obviously with uh we look like we're headed into a, a recession and uh, it can be difficult to raise money in those circumstances but um lucid still has 4.6 billion in cash and investment so it's not in dire need of cash right now but it burned through $823 million tax water. So it goes fast. And they burned through that because uh, to get that $100 million in revenue, they had to spend $292 million in cost of revenue. So they are losing a lot of money per car right now. So they need to turn that around. Kind of a similar situation as Rivian, but in uh, lower volume, obviously. And uh, yeah, then then you, the, the big thing that really caught my attention here is their operating expenses. Operating exp expenses as f at 550, uh, yeah, five, $559 million loss in operating expenses. Um, that, if you compare that to Tesla, Tesla is 1.7 billion. So they have about a third of Tesla's operating expenses, even though they delivered revenue uh, 150. <laughs> A 155th of Tesla's revenue yes. and a third of the operating expenses. It makes absolute no sense right now. They need to rein that in big time because they won't last uh, a year without raising a lot of money. And even like putting money into that would, it would make no sense for a lot of people. Of course, they are backed by the Saudis right now, and the Saudis right. might have like other <clears throat> reason to 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 back the company. But also, the, if they back it, they're gonna try to get more. Uh, ownership in it and all that so if lucids wants to retain its independence uh they, they're gonna have to find a way to rein that in because it makes no sense to or make a more. lot more cars yeah make a lot more cars and make them profitably which uh, they're far from being able to do right now so i think i think they have to look at their operating expenses and bring that down because it makes no sense they spend a third of tesla's operating budget 
to bringing 155th of their revenue. Like I, yeah. I, at their size that they are right now, this has a hundred thousand employees. They have like six thousand employees, uh, or maybe a, a six thousand might just be their factory. I'm not sure. They probably have more than that. Um, but still, Tesla is a giant company uh, operating hundreds of uh, hundreds of stores and service centers for factories. Uh, ton of different operation. Like there's no sense that you you would be operating at one third of their <laughs> Right, their expenses. That's not to say that uh, people don't love the car. Like, uh, oh, Scooter, yeah. Scooter just drove the car up uh, the PCH, and he was just ranting and raving how much it was amazing. Oh so. yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's a great car, and uh, there's a lot of great things about it that I can see also like translating to a lower end vehicle. That yeah. uh, like the, their efficiencies are, are just stunning. Like the the amount of power that you can get from a very small electric motor. Uh, beautiful small inverter. Their, their their battery technology is solid too. Battery pack. I mean, they don't make their own cells, but battery pack technology. Like, there's a lot of great thing about Lucid that obviously now they are putting in a high end vehicle, but they could put that in a lower end vehicle and produce a lot more of them. But obviously, they are far from that because they won't be able to achieve that if they cannot make money on a hundred plus thousand vehicles, which they are far from being able to do right now. So, uh, there, there's something that needs to change, um, but so it's something to keep an eye on. Oh, speaking of that, um, and you know, not to jump into the comments a little early, but Jonathan Root says Apple should buy Lucid. It's their only chance to enter the EV game at this point. What do you think about Apple as a potential acquisition? Uh, I think that would be super smart. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be the move to do. Uh, I think, th like I said, there's a lot of good things here. I, the problem is like it, it would be an expensive purchase for Apple. I know Apple has all the money in the world right now, but uh i think it still trades at like 30 billion dollars uh lucid and uh i would assume that they would have to do um some kind of uh premium on that <laughs> i don't know about right. how much so this um maybe and, it even, keeps going down and still then a lot of people would be mad i think because a lot of people paid a lot more than 30 billion dollars for, right. for lucid so they really and that would be the the end of their hope for any return so it's it would be a difficult transaction to make i think yeah, but the Saudis yeah, might not want to get rid of it either. That too, too. Yeah, there's a lot, lot, a lot of things that could make this transaction uh, difficult. But if Apple is ex very serious about bringing to market an electric vehicle, I think they could use a lot of uh, Lucid's technology to do it. They could. Um, it's a very Apple-like thing. Like it's a very yeah. premium. Like all the all the stuff that they've done, like with the motors and the batteries, is very Apple-y. Mm -hmm. You know, best of breed, high end, high tech. Maybe and, they should uh, just uh, give Peter a call and say, uh, it doesn't sound like Lucid's going so well. Maybe uh, you can uh, occupy Doug Field's old office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I could I could see it happen. It's just, like I said, it's going to be super difficult. And for on Apple side, too, it's spending, let's say they spend like $50 billion on this. This is, you, you need to get a good return for like $50 billion, that giant transaction. They could use the factory in Arizona, though, of course. Like I'm sure, I'm sure there's already... Probably a few billion dollars spent there already, so that's there's, there's, there's value in that. There's no doubt, but uh, yeah, but thirty to fifty billion dollars that they would have to pay would be a, a hard decision. And it, what's what's uh, Apple's latest big acquisition? They're not they're not big on like huge they don't, scale acquisition. No, right? they bought Beats. I think was the latest big one. That was a long time ago, and that was like, how much? Yeah, even was that even in the f billions? It was in the billions. I think it was yeah. uh, like maybe five billion or something. Really, that much? Wow. Well, it was the uh, the streaming player that became Apple Music was more than I think for them the Mog Music player was worth more than the uh, the hardware. Mm. Ah. Okay. All right. I think we can jump into the comments right now. All right. <clears throat> Forty four minutes in. All right. So, uh, Jonathan Root, uh, the Elon shareholder meeting was really the fanboy roundup. I did notice like this, like it's gotten even more and more fanboy like beforehand. And then like, you know, Elon's talking and everybody's hooting and hollering. Oh. Like, it doesn't seem like a shareholder meeting at all. Yeah. That, that, that's unhealthy to me. I think when, when they all go crazy and then Elon comes on stage with his arms up like that, like, yeah, right. like it's like, let's like the old cult of personality and everything is, so it seems a little bit off to me. Not, not like I'm a big fan of the guy. I think he's doing great things. It's just that 
it gets into like on LT territories, I think. But my, my big thing is like I saw like all of the same like Tesla Twitter people that Elon that are just like super all, all praise to Elon all, all the time. They were all there. And that seems weird to me because this whole shareholder meeting thing is supposed to be a random draw uh, to to for fairness and everything like that. It's just all these people just won the random draw. <laughs> That's kind of weird to me. It is. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know what. how do you uh, square it. doesn't make any sense. All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, our our friend was, he's sick of EV. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Michael. Like, sick of EV, it's a great option, but it's more costly than combustion. Nope, it's not. If you go by cost of ownership, it's simply not. So I don't know what you're talking about, Michael. Hopefully uh, the show convinced him and yeah. he'll stick around. Uh, surprised that the child labor reporting was rejected uh, in the shareholder. I, I think that's probably sarcastic. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, they're, 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 like, if you just listen to every one of the stockholder proposal that they were doing, which were all about governance stuff, uh, they all had very good arguments. They all made sense. And they all things that you would support uh, as face value is just that the, the board said to vote against it for convenience reasons <laughs> so it's just it would be hard to to implement and it would right. put this as a disadvantage to competition and all that but i mean for the child labor one we discussed that before that's something that the naysayers when it comes to batteries and electric vehicles they are often often bringing up that uh, especially cobalt and in congo there's child labor being used which which is true and is a, a real concern it's just that it's 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 such a, a a different issue than than the way people frame it. It's just like ah, right, like if we need to stop, we need to stop using cobalt because that will stop people from using child labor, which is not exactly true. Like it's a it's all education issue, and it's a it, like most of the cobalt doesn't come from child labor. Obviously, it's it's a problem what we would be called artisanal mining, where the Congo is so rich in natural resources that there's a lot of people that just go out there and, and and put like together a small operation to to extract the the resources from from the earth while most of the actual volume obviously comes from giant mining operation that use machinery equipment and qualified personnel to do it that's how most of it come from but there's some of them that uh, the the some of the mineral that ends up on the market comes from these smaller artisanal shops that do use child labor because it's just it, that's that's how it works in those communities where you know you're 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 13 years old well i mean you're not earning your stay uh, you don't you're not going to school or anything like that so like you're going to go work with mom and dad and uh, uh, at the little artisanal mine there so I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying that it's it's more of an educational and like geopolitical issue in those uh, specific areas that need to be addressed. Uh, it's more. It's not because like co cobalt is valuable. That uh, I mean, I'm sure that's part of it too. Like if it wasn't valuable, they wouldn't as be uh, be interested to do it. But those kids would be working one way or the other. It sounds like. Uh, so I think it's more of a specific issue that needs to be addressed on like how do we get these kids to school. And uh, then, uh, then we cannot use cobalt because of uh, uh, there's there's a small percentage of it that is used by child labor. No, it's my opinion. Yep, I agree. All right, moving on. It's a Raven. I don't trust anything Elon says. We are still waiting on autopilot. Don't buy it. You're waiting uh, on autopilot. <laughs> it's been around uh, since 2016. Probably full self driving. Yeah, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, he's been wrong about that uh, mm -hmm. going on like uh, six years in a row. So yeah, he, he changed the gold again uh, this week. And uh, by the way, did I don't he? know if you if you caught that. Like, uh, you, you know, you went from like a million robo taxi by the end of the year to a million people on FSD beta to the end of the year, and now it was everyone who wants FSD beta by the end of the year is gonna get it. Because that never makes sense to us. Because I'm like, is there even a million people in North America that can get? Full self driving right now, or bought it at least, and I was like, that I don't, that doesn't sound right to me. We'll see. I I mean, I want FSD, and uh, yeah. I'm not on it, so maybe I uh, only have six months to wait. Yep, that's great. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Ghetto Crypto says, uh, "Great content and always, fellows. Been watching for a good while. Y'all bring great information and some cool ass bikes. Yes, thank you. That's mm -hmm. great. 
uh, the bike is the other podcast too. <laughs> All right. And moving on, Tyler Donahoe, the problem with humanoid robots has always been AI and motor control. The human form and function has been nailed down since animatronics workers got a huge boost by Disney in the 1970s. Hmm. Thoughts there? Uh, I mean, like that's that's kind of why they're doing it, though. Like they they have some expertise in AI and motor control, so they uh, they, they feel like they can solve those issues. But uh, the human form and function has been nailed down since in Metronics. Like I don't know if that's true. Like that's choreographed stuff that not, don't apply to any useful function other than entertainment. So. I mean, I don't think you can have animatronics like have like like usable fingers that uh, can can do things that are practical. Oh. Yep. All right. And then Tyler, uh, the robots are just puppets. The mind, the AI is the final frontier. Yeah, I mean that that would like negate everything that Boston Dynamic has been working on for years. Like they've been making great stride in like making robots functionals. Uh, I don't think I don't think I agree with that. That that we figured out humanoid robots for a long time. Yeah, this is a concern, I guess. Anyone else concerned for a world with Elon robots? So yeah, in <laughs> in the event that these AI robots do happen and Elon's controlling them all, uh, that does bring up some concerns. Like, uh, would that be a world we'd want to live in? I don't know. Yeah, it's a little scary. Uh, no, noting how he. Uh, seems to jump around a lot um, in his uh, viewpoints. All right. Well, the 20 Tesla can't get autopilot, not FSD to stop phantom braking 100%. That's true. I uh, also have that problem. There's no way they're going to leapfrog other AI and robotics companies. I don't know about that. Like uh, people always, uh, when uh, like uh, we, we had Tyler, Ty, uh, Taylor, Ty, Tyler, Taylor, Taylor Ogan on the, on the, on the podcast. I always have issue with these two names, T uh, Taylor Ogan. On the, on the podcast, who's an early FSD beta uh, driver and a big critic of Tesla's FSD program. And he always uh, is quick to, to, to say, like, look at the Google and well, Waymo, I should say, and uh, Cruise and all that, and compare it to those. And I'm like, I, I can see how Tesla's approach can leapfrog those. That's the whole thing. Like, the, it could, it's a possibility that, that, that it happens because the way that the approach is different and, and utilize mass amount of data machine learning and of course dojo now is being part of the game and dojo could if it works it could be a, a big game changer and enable that big jump in, in in capacity um but yeah i i can also understand the argument that looking at the current state and looking again like role a20 said that with the phantom braking situation autopilot it can be hard to see uh to 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 make the connection between the end goal and what's happening right now but I wouldn't discount them either, man. I, I'm not, and I've been a big critic of FSD beta. I mean, I have it on my car, and it's uh, I literally every time I activate it, it's like I'm like, oh, let's get to work, and like, Doop. I'm like, all right, like now I'm, I need to just control. Like I feel like I'm in the passenger seat of one of those like uh, student cars where you have like two set of uh, steering wheel and uh, and brake pedals. Like that's how I feel like uh, when yep. I'm on FSD beta. All right, uh, moving on. It's a Raven says brake dust and rubber wear from tires still give us health problems of doom. We need to get away from cars. <laughs> well, I would say that uh, electric vehicles reduce brake dust by a lot. Yeah, because and I think brake dust is a is a way bigger problem than tires. I would assume, right? Right. Like dust from rubber wear from tires. Rubber. I've I've heard like brake dust to be a real issues in cities. That's true. Like it's a uh, it's bad, but rubber wear. That's the first time I've heard it. Yeah, rubber tree plant can't be that bad, right? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. But I know, I don't know. Like, I mean, you can smell it when that, like, at a racetrack or something. But for like average driving, it's, it doesn't burn rubber that much. Um, but I, to to his point, though, I do agree that uh, a lot of people could get away from cars. Like, if you work in the cities and uh, if you have like a commute that's like less than like five miles, ten miles, I mean, get yourself on electric bikes. Those things are. Incredible. Yep, agree. Uh, Jonathan Root's back. Um, I'm wondering. I'm worried the Cybertruck won't even qualify the, for the tax credit. Might start at 100k. Can't even get a Model Y for under 65k. That's a valid concern. I yeah. I also wonder if uh, Tesla can sell it for 
tax credit money. I don't think it's going to happen. What do you think? Well, a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I might be I might be surprised if uh, like the first version comes out with uh, like a quad motor powertrain, a hundred thousand dollars, like a just a kind of like a Hummer EV type of uh, like super truck that JMM calls it. Uh, that that's that's a very likely possibility in my opinion. However, the starting price I'm fairly confident going to be under eighty thousand dollars for like a dual motor version of it. Uh, smaller battery pack, like I, I would be shocked if it if it's more than eighty thousand uh, dollars. Especially, especially like bare, like the cyber truck. Like, look at the interior. Like, it's not it's not a fancy interior. Like, you get into like a, a F one fifty Lightning Lariat, La- Lariat, 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 and it's a fancy interior. Like, it's a luxury interior, basically. Like, you don't you won't see that in a cyber truck. It's it's the whole Tesla minimalist approach and everything. Um, I, I'm I'm not as worried as Jonathan is on that front. Yeah, I mean, you know, who knows by the time those things are delivered if they're going to still have a tax. I mean, we don't even know if they're, they're going to pass it at this point. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on. Comment. Wouldn't regular panels always be cheaper, easier to install? It's way less pieces going from hundreds of tiles to two or three big panels seems way faster. Uh, I think generally speaking, yes. Um, but one thing is that it you you have to do a roof and panels, yeah. whereas on a new construction, the idea is that you would only have to do um, the solar roof. So <clears throat> the solar roof is probably less work than doing a full roof and then putting panels on the roof. And theoretically, it looks better and it's quicker and whatever. Oh, what, what, what you said is true, but there's something to add to is that where people always like miss their calculation is like they, they calculate like, okay, that's a new asphalt roof with uh, with, with, with uh, solar panels. That's like, ah, oh, it is cheaper than a solar roof. It's like, yeah, but like the way you have to, you cannot compare it to like half uh, asphalt tiles on, on, on a roof. You have to compare it to the more high end roofing solution like concrete and and those uh, tiles, like they have, what they call it, those like the, uh, like um, like Spanish style tiles and all those. I think that's concrete right. too. Probably concrete. Anyway, those higher hand roofs with longer uh, warranty and all that. Uh, when you compare that to that plus solar panels, it becomes more expensive than just straight solar roof. Again, depending on your uh, soil or your roof configuration. Yep. All right, what kind of pricing are we thinking on the Cybertruck? Uh, we kind of talked about that earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to start at 40000 though. No, that's for sure. I, I, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking a base version in $60,000 that's probably not going to be delivered until until 2025, 2026 even maybe. Uh, then like an eighty thousand version that's gonna be the most popular one, uh, and then probably a hundred thousand dollar version fully equipped. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wonder uh, if, it, like, by the time these things do come out, like, how how fast is te- Tesla gonna ramp the Cybertruck? Like, are they gonna? Well, that's get- the thing that we discussed earlier. Like, Elon, when you said volume production mid twenty twenty three, I was like, oh, I thought it was starting production in twenty twenty three. Those those things are different. Yeah, I don't think he knows what he's saying because that's a year from now. I don't like that. So if it was a Model Y, like at a new factory, I can see a year. Mm -hmm. But this is a whole new process. Yeah. I mean, maybe he knows something we don't. Also, 4680 sounds like you need the 4680 and those have been way behind schedule. Though though he said that he expect volume production in, in Giga Ferry, Texas by the end of the year so. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tyler Donahoe, lack of frunk is extremely disappointing on the BMW. Should be mandatory on sedan form factors. What a waste. I agree it's a waste because it's a huge trunk or front front bonnet, whatever. But, you know, I'm not married to a, a frunk. Like, uh, you know, the Chevy Bolt, which has almost no front end, doesn't have a, a frunk. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't bother me. I never use it on my Model 3, to be honest. A frunk. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you have a big front end and you you know mm-hmm. it's for the crumple zone or whatever you might as well put one there but i kind of feel like you know volkswagen also uh the id4 doesn't have a frunk i don't miss it um it is nice to have a, another place but it's not a big deal to me um it looks like they took the standard bmw ice 4 series chassis and converted it yep 
Well, that, again, that's not exactly true. Their old thinking, to be fair, <clears throat> was they built a new generation of the platform that accommodates ICE, PHEV, and PAV. Yeah. That's the old thinking. So the, it's been, they could claim that it's been designed from the ground up to be electric. That would be fair because, but it's been designed to be electric and plug in hybrid and uh, internal combustion engine. But if you look at the inside, Fred, I, I shit you not, it is, yeah. it is no. really, really poorly done. Yeah, like it's really loose. Um, there's like they put like metal sheet metal things just to hold things, and it's yeah. it just really looks like high school engineering project. Um, 300 with the headwind going downhill. Oh yeah, that's the range of the uh, BMW. And you know, it was similar to me to the the Model Three. Like the Model Three says it's going to go 300 miles, but realistically, it's in the the mid 200s. This is this is the same for me. Uh, Giovanni Edwards just added the podcast to my library. Love what you're all doing. Thank you, everyone. Add it to your library. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a standard battery testing standard? For instance, I'm aware of a particular process by a manufacturer that is using a temperature chamber to address durability in both the vehicles and the chargers. Uh, I don't think there is one standard testing process. I think each battery manufacturer and OEM kind of uses their own testing. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, they, they, they do put a lot of cycles trying to replicate how it would be in the real world. Uh, however, I'm not exactly sure what that kind of standard looks like or what kind of like uh, bench test that they have. Uh, it would be something interesting looking into. I know that uh, when Tesla did the partnership with the University of Halifax, uh, Dalhousie University, and uh, Jeff Zahn's team, that's one of one of their biggest expertise is to uh, like to test the uh, batteries. Yep. All right, Tyler Donahoe is get back. Apple would need to work hard to get that company lucid up and running profitably. Probably have to ask a few executives and get some actual business acumen injected. Well, yeah, yeah that's, 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 the, that's the thinking. Yes, <laughs> that would be the, the goal. I mean, not, not, I don't want to be too criticizing of lucid. Like, I think they're doing some great things. But uh, yeah, I mean, they have to turn this thing around right now. It's not looking good to me, financially speaking. Joel Sapp notes that uh, if Apple's serious about having their own car company, they will buy a car company, EV company, when the world is in recession, which may be now, depending on how you define recession, but uh, cheapest mm -hmm. prices and could be easily to pick off competition. That's a good point. Maybe they can wait on Lucid, like being closer, like to 10, 15, 20 billion dollars. And then, oh, we'll scoop it in for like a, a nice little $5 billion premium. And maybe investor would be more willing at that point. Yeah. All right, Jonathan Root, uh, good point regarding the child labor issue. Blood diamonds used to be a thing before stronger monitoring of the supply chains happened. I also think uh, De Beers yeah. did some good marketing and, yeah. and stuff there as well. But it's a good point. Oh, here, here we go. Mike Thompson, electric yeah, cars I mean, are horrible for the environment. <laughs> on cobalt. Uh, the, uh, the, Oops, sorry, sorry, we lost you there for a second. We talked over each other like there was a little bit of a lag. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's okay. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Elon and humanoid robots. One only needs to look at his treatment of workers and collective bargaining to know how that would go. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, on one hand, it would be nice that, you know, he could just tell robots to work 24 hours a day and nobody would care. On the other hand, you know, is he going to use the robots to, you know, form an army and and reproduce or whatever it is? I, I, don't, I don't think that the uh, employees of Tesla have too much to worry about when it comes to Optimus. Because first of all, they're going to have to build Optimus. <laughs> right. And I don't think they're going to really build a replacement. Like if anything, it's going to be used to alleviate some of the work and like, like, again, if Tesla is hiring, like it's going to build to uh, eight more gigafactories in the next eight years, um, they're going to need a lot more workers. <laughs> Regardless yeah. of optimism, my point is. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Doug Underwood says, great channel. Thanks. Wondering when the electric outboard market will take off. I know there's some out there. Yeah, there's not a lot right now. It's like the Torquedo. There's, uh, I, I like uh, the one of the, uh, to be fair, I invested in the company, so I'm a bit biased, but the Vision Marine Technologies, they have one coming up that like is like as close as a pure outboard motor replacement that you can get that's just all electric uh, for most, like the most powerful 
type of boats. Once you have a lot of options like that on the market, I think it's going to take off real fast because uh, outboards motors like they, they are energy intensive. They, 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 the gas costs are high, so it would make sense. And instead of having like right now, you do have some very cool electric boats out there, and like you can check out those company like I, uh, X Shores and Canela and uh, and all those very cool electric boat companies. But just ha ha integrating an electric outboard motor to existing boats that that makes a lot more sense, obviously. Oh, and so I, I when I used to go fishing, there was a, a company called Min Kota that made trolling motors that you would hook up to a twelve volt battery. Oh yeah, trolling that's, motors is already like that. That's been around for like electric trolling motors. Been but like, uh, the company Min Kota now has something called the Raptor, which is a Ooh. high high power thing that I'm going to have to look into. Yeah. And Mink Min Kota has been making electric motors forever. Yeah, I mean uh, that, that that's kind of obvious to like trolling motors, uh, electric trolling motors that have been around for so long. It's like all right, we we can make just a more powerful version of that. Like it's just. Yep. All right, Dan Oberts brakes used to use asbestos, not anymore. The tire rubber is something anti EV folks used to had to dream up when people pointed out that regen reduce brake dust problems. Yeah, possibly. That, sounds that, like that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> sounds about right. Sounds like something those people would do. Yeah. All right. Uh, viewership on YouTube seems to peak at 40 minutes in. The only way I yeah. catch these is because I subscribed and hit the notification bell. Great. Oh, well, thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, sorry. Yeah, let's uh, hit the notification bell, everyone, so that you can... Uh, yeah, I, I, and I do know this. Sometimes it's a bit behind, too, like the notification. Like I get it on my phone. That we are 20 minutes into the show or something. But uh, yeah, any yeah, thoughts that... on the latest Cyberlander render? Oh, I don't know. I haven't checked them out yet. I should because I supposedly I have one coming. I don't Is know. That... I mean, I, I like the concept of Cyberlander. It's awesome. It's it's great and everything. But they kind of lost me a little bit when they started to raise money at four hundred million dollar valuation for like the whole company is completely dependent on another company delivering a product and the whole product is designed without the product on which it's going to be designed on like and again their design is amazing it looks awesome and everything but i'm just like you cannot raise money at 400 million dollar valuation for a product like that i'm just i'm sorry it makes no sense and i know they have a lot of like they have like 50 million dollars in the reservation again i mean that's that's fine whatever that's it that's it's, incredible yeah like I, I, I just, I, you, you lose. You, they lost a lot of credibility to me when they, then they did that. I'm like, I thought they would be a little bit more. Um, like they know what they, uh, they know what they were doing, but they, they still do. Like the, the again, the design is awesome. It's just it lost a little bit of credibility. All right. Um. So we have one last comment, which is going to transition to a, uh, segue into a uh, look on our channel. So. Joel Sapp says, I know you have a short podcast. Any chance you do a daily EV YouTube channel? Yes, we do that. Uh, so it's a different YouTube channel. No, I think I think he says that he knows that set. Any chance you do a daily EV right. YouTube channel? Well, he said, I know you have a short podcast, so I think he knows about Quick Charge. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so he's just Quick Charge is our daily uh a daily podcast, daily YouTube channel mm -hmm. for the daily news. Uh go search it up yeah maybe he's thinking of something different when he says like dv, DV. <clears throat> maybe you're talking about us directly i don't know like it's mikey that doesn't but mikey does a great job to like yep. round up all of the news of the day we're just uh cannot do it all <laughs> but yeah, uh, thanks everyone for listening to the show this week i appreciate every single one of you and if you can hit the like button the subscribe button and like a tyler uh, Taylor, Tyler says, oh, these two names are so hard for me. Um, uh, the, uh, then you can hit the notification button. That will notify you whenever we go live and whenever we post a new video, which we do several times a week with against Mikey. Though Mikey is on the Electric Daily channel uh, yeah. to, to answer uh, Joel's question. It's the Electric Daily. It's called Quick Charge. And um, and then you uh, you can also get our MICA videos for electric bikes and electric transportation here. And we're going to have a lot more coming up on the channel soon. So thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you same place, same time next week.